Thanks for listening to the Forest Ramble podcast. Please subscribe and leave a review on your podcast provider, as this helps other Forest supporters find our content. Now on with the pod! Well, this was unexpected. It's the summer break and we were kind of hoping to be able to do, uh, you know, have a bit of a break ourselves. But uh, on Friday, the bombshell dropped. Martin O'Neill has left Nottingham Forest, has been sacked. And we say bienvenue to Sabri Lamushi. Um, I'm joined by Stephen Topless. Hello. Hello. Uh, by the Maradon in the Midlands. Hello. Hello. And by Baz. Hello. Hello. Now, Baz, uh, we've only got you for a little while, so I just want to start off uh, with you. Um... Was it a surprise to see O'Neill go? Yes, <laughs> very much so. Mm. Um, yeah, absolutely. It came completely out of the blue as far as I was concerned. I'd heard like little bits and pieces about this player on rest, but I didn't think anything was going to come of it. Um, so, yeah, it was an absolute surprise. So it was like one of those, maybe for once we're going to be a stable club for a little while, but... No, not to be. Yeah, and um, the kinds of themes that, that kind of came to my mind were, obviously, was it a surprise? There's the whole issue about the player unrest. Um, there's also um, an issue about, I, rem- I, I distinctly remember the kind of, the pivotal moment, I suppose, of the Fawaz regime. Uh, the day we got our new big screens, but then he sacked Sean O'Driscoll. And I remember you distinctly saying, um, rich man's plaything. Is Forrest under Maranakis anything different to a rich man's plaything as it was under Fawaz? Um, I do not think that at all. I think Maranakis is the complete opposite of Fawaz. He's utterly focused on doing, on uh, building something that's going to last here. Um, and his record but, of sacking coaches at Olympiakos doesn't give you any cause for concern? Um, I think he's also the sort of person who's quite happy to get rid of, in many ways, <laughs> the people that stand in his way to achieving his goals. Um, so, I, I, uh, but uh, whether it's, I mean, whether it's, uh, it's I think all this, the infrastructure he's put in place at Forest about the, the way the, the club treats people in the community and the way that the, the PR that's been going on, is absolutely fantastic, and because of that, he can't be compared to Foaz. The only similarity is maybe sacking people, but it remains to be seen what, what's been going on behind the scenes on that front. OK, and uh, yeah, so, uh, and then there's also the issue of, of Sabri Lamushi, um, which was announced, I think, 18 minutes after O'Neill's sacking was announced. Um, the other thing that's uh, notable is, that, of course, the pre-season training photographs had Martin, you know, there's a picture of Martin there with a big smile on his face. So um, things moved very quickly there, didn't they? Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of what's... Uh, so they obviously had uh, Sabri lined up. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was like, when did when did all this kick off? When did uh, Maranakis make the decision? And um, and when did Mo- O'Neill find out about it? Because obviously it, it seems like it didn't happen until just before. So yeah, yeah. There, there's there's a few questions to be answered there. Okay. Um, and overall, do you think that this is a positive move by the club in terms of if the players are unhappy, um, Roy Keane had gone um, to remove O'Neill from being the manager with a year left on his contract and install a new man? I think that, um, well, it's no secret that I wasn't absolutely overjoyed about him, especially I never want to see a Forest side gunning for 25% possession as a target. So, uh, but then the last three games of the the season showed that he, he could play a different way. So, from my point of view, it was like, I've got mixed feelings. I'm not going to shed any tears that he's gone, but it's a bit, it's the circumstances of him going that are the, are the bigger, bigger question. I think the fact that um, whether the, the, the real, real issue is whether Sabri can do the job or not, because obviously he's completely new to English football. He's actually quite new to being a manager in general. So it's, it's, that's the, the, the real unknown 
Although it's worth pointing out that, um, you know, someone uh, did make the point on Twitter that the last three managers to have won the championship uh, went in there without having any championship experience. Now, Rafa Benitez is a very different kettle of fish. But then yeah. since then, we also had Nuno Espirito Santo and Daniel Farca, um, who were both new to manage, relatively new to management full stop and new to managing in in the championship before they came to England. Yeah, and Guy Moussi says the way he relates with players is exactly what Forrest need at the moment, and he, because of that, he thinks he might be a success. So uh, that's that's the opinion of someone who knows him. So I guess that's something to look at. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much, Baz, and uh, we shall have more from you once the season starts, assuming there are no other bombshells in the meantime. <laughs> so, all right. Cheers. Okay, so we had some thoughts there from Baz, um, and I have to say is the the key factor there was it was a bit of a surprise from the outside looking in, wasn't it, Married on the Midlands? It was. I, I was sort of going about my business at work and suddenly heard the news break on TalkSport, and I was I was audibly shocked by <laughs> the news. Um, I, I just I didn't see it coming at all at this time. Stephen? Me too. I was just sat at, sat at work. Looking at the, uh, the new kit which had been announced just a, <laughs> a few hours Time before. Time well spent. It just got the new kit on my mind and suddenly O'Neill's gone. And uh, completely out of the blue. And like Baz, I thought that there would be some sort of stability with O'Neill. And he'd be in for at least the the duration of his contract. So that mm-hmm. would take him to the end of this season. And yeah, just completely okay. shocked by it. And then... Lamucci coming in within 18 minutes. Yes, uh, and I think it's probably fair to say that he might have signed a contract before uh, Martin had been given his marching orders. Um, right, so let's have a look at that at that timeline. So the news broke, I think it was something like 20 past one or something in the afternoon. I mean, I was, uh, I was elsewhere... Um, otherwise engaged for work purposes, and I, I get a text message from, uh, from Mrs. Ferraro just saying, Martin has left, and that's the way it was announced. It wasn't that he was sacked, it's that he had left. Any significance in that? Um, I, no, I don't think so. I just don't think they want to say they sacked him. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I just, yeah I, think, I think he's probably been sacked. I, I, I can't. Well, I mean, and, and Danny Taylor, who was the person who broke the story initially, and, you know, I think... It's clear, it's pretty obvious to anyone who listens to this podcast that we, we've got a lot of time for Danny Taylor, not only as a Forest supporter, but as a journalist. Um, so if he says it was a sacking and he was the one who broke the news, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to kind of accept that that's the case. Um, so, so, so Martin O'Neill is sacked. Um, and yeah, like you say, just less than 20 minutes later, Lamushi is announced. Um, very, very quick timeline. The other thing that was significant about that timeline is it wasn't very long after that before first Danny Taylor and the, in The Guardian and then Paul Taylor in The Post then had articles published which were talking about the kind of the nature of, of the problem. So let's go back a few days and let's talk about the departure of Roy Keane. So Stephen, was that a surprise? It was to a degree. Um... In that, I assumed that him being back at Forest was important to him and working alongside Martin and getting ready for the new season because pre-season had just started or was just about to start at least when Roy decided to leave. But I wasn't surprised from the angle of he probably wants to be a manager again in his own right, which is fair enough. Which is the official explanation is given it? is that he, he would like to be a manager. Yeah. And I assumed he perhaps had something lined up or something's been offered to him and that's why he left. But maybe now we things are slightly different. OK, Married on the Midlands, do you think there's any correlation between the departure of Keane and the sacking of O'Neill? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was surprised to him though because I, I thought he, he would stay in and maybe there was some sort of succession plan in place for him to maybe, if, if it was going well under O'Neill... Um, for him to take over eventually. Um, 
but it's, it's very confusing because like, for him to leave without having a job lined up, because I, I, I immediately assumed that as well, that he had some, some job lined up somewhere uh, for him to do that. Because there's no, nothing to stop him taking a managerial job w- later on, even if he's at, at Forest as the assistant. And of course, what we don't know is he hasn't got a job lined up because just like Lamushi was clearly offered the job before O'Neill was sacked, we don't know that Keane's not waiting for a club to sort out the severance details with a current manager or something like that, do we? Yeah, and it, it could be somewhere abroad. You just don't know. OK. Um, now, the reason that I suspect that that's significant is because um, reading between the lines a little bit, and if, naturally, you know, the modern nature of football coverage being what it is, people have done, um, there is... A theory that uh, Keane was the glue holding the group together and he was acting as a an effective go-between between between the players and O'Neill so with him gone there was there wasn't that filter anymore Um, now married on the Midlands you said at the time that the uh, that Keane was uh, came in as the assistant manager that is like going from rather than good cop, bad cop, it's bad cop and even worse cop. But it sounds as though Keane actually was very popular amongst the players and had that respect amongst the players um, as being someone who they grew up with and someone who they liked his no-nonsense attitude. Yeah, I mean, the fact that we didn't hear any, any bad stories come out about Roy during during his time at Forest seems to suggest that's true. Um, I just don't understand why they wouldn't let Martin find another assistant. I just I, I was I was assuming he was looking around trying to find somebody suitable, a younger man again, because his 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 uh, way of working as a manager has always been as sort of as an as an oversight overlooker, uh, with somebody else working with the players on a daily basis, sort of delegating his coaching duties and having go betweens, whether it was Robertson or now Keane. So I was thinking, and people have mentioned Chris Cohen and Jack Lester, that mm-hmm. sort of younger man, maybe with the Forest connection, who's who's got uh, fresh coaching ideas to act as the go-between. So, to me, the, the natural action after Roy Keane left would have been to bring in that assistant manager, not to sack Martin O'Neill. Basically have another good cop. Yeah. OK. Stephen? Yeah, I I was under the assumption that that's exactly what was happening. Martin was just working on finding a new assistant to come in and... Uh, Pre-season had, had started by that point, so it was just a case of carrying on and, uh, you know, filling the void that was left by, by Roy Keane going. But when you start to, as you say, read between the lines and you start to read a bit more, particularly Danny Taylor's article where, they, where he talks about the players not really connecting with O'Neill, but they knew of Roy Keane and obviously because of his decorated playing career and everything that he achieved they seem to be more excited about working with Roy Keane than they were Martin O'Neill. So maybe that's just a generational thing as well. And sadly for Martin, an indicator of where the game has probably moved on in the last 10 years or even since he was last in club management. OK. I mean, there is, there is a whole issue of, of the tail wagging the dog here, isn't there? Uh, but we've seen it at many bigger clubs. We've seen it at Chelsea and Man United in recent years, whereby the a perfectly, on the face of it, a perfectly decent gaffer gets kind of run out of the club by a cabal of players who say, well, we don't like the way yeah, he does things. But that's, that's fine if you're a, a group of international players who've won the Champions League, World Cups and what have you. Our players are a bunch of no marks, if we're brutally honest about it. There's one player, Michael Dawson, who's achieved anything in the game. The rest of them have done nothing. Mm-hmm. Like, they have no right to to dictate who is a manager or have this sort of opinion. They, they, I don't see why their opinion weighted so much with the ownership. Well, now, of course, the thing that we can talk about is we've got some empirical evidence. We've got some evidence that Martin O'Neill came in and tactically and results-wise, it didn't work until he went back to doing the thing that most fans had been saying, which is, let's play Carvalho, give him a free role, let's enable Lolly to have a bit of support so that he can, um, so we can harness his creativity and ability to run with the ball. Um, and Martin built around that. He went to the back three to enable us to have those two floating players. And then also to, that enabled and Sarafard us to get the best out of him. Um, so, you know, it's one of those, I hate to say I told you so, but we told you so. But I think 
but I think the stories that are breaking since then, since the sacking, maybe indicate why he wasn't able to do that. The, uh, the stories of indiscipline and players being dropped for disciplinary reasons. Maybe he he restricted his own choice by dropping certain players and not and not playing them, and that maybe ha- hamstrung him in in his team selections and his options. We that's what that's the stories that seems to be coming out. There seems to be. Um, the, fe- the, the one that's come out with where a player's been named is Gajora, not wanting to cool down. But there's there's a couple of other in- instances where uh, Dane Taylor has sort of has indicated player indiscipline, players not not turning up for training or being late for training and not turning up for catch the bus and things. So one or two of the players who seemed at the time to be odd selection, odd droppings. <laughs> that's, that's a strange yeah. phrase. But that's right. We've worked with Milosevic. Um, Maybe Carvalho, there's one or two others who we, we couldn't understand why, having played so well, they weren't getting anywhere near the team. Maybe it's becoming clear now why they weren't near, anywhere near the team. I, I mean, with that in mind, one of the strange ones was, uh, you know, Robinson. Um, so he didn't get to play at left back because he played Colback at left back. And then when Colback was, uh, was suspended, then he moved Robinson back to left back and gave, well, left side of a three and gave him the captain's armband. It was a, it, there's. They're, from the outside looking in, there's a, there is a distinct lack of logic. So, OK, let's go back to that, the, the stuff that Danny Taylor reported. Now, the Gediora thing, Stephen. The main thing that's extraordinary about that, to me, is the fact that Danny Taylor named names of a current player and also actually challenged him on Twitter about it. Because Adlen responded to the tweet with this with you know this is the inside story from from danny taylor and then he responded to it saying i was hoping to see some insight but then i got the plot of a netflix film and then danny taylor responded saying adlen did you or did you not refuse to cool down after that match if the answer is you did not refuse then i'm quite happy to meet with you and the club hierarchy to to thrash it out really extraordinary stuff Stephen. it is that, that... Sort of, especially from, you know, a very decorated, well respected you know, he's well known as being one of the finest um, football correspondents, football writers in the entire and he's, country. He's clearly got a, the inside track. He's got got people on the inside telling him what's happening because he, he keeps on breaking these stories yeah, yeah. time and time but again. That, right, that's the nature of journalism. But naming people like that, highly unusual. It is, and on a public platform as well, where we're seeing that the two of them have this little conversation was, yeah, very, um, <laughs> almost explosive, really. You don't see that sort of thing happen often. And Gedi Aura, interestingly, didn't deny that he didn't call down after the Ipswich game. Not publicly. No. We, so... don't, we, don't, we don't know, if, you know, it's quite possible that, that Adlen, you know, either personally or via the club has been in contact with, with Danny Taylor and The Guardian. And we don't, we don't I know think, that. I think Danny Taylor must have had the blessing of the club to name him. Oh, I'd have I think so, yeah. so that, Which indicates to me that the club are quite happy to see him go off the off the wage bill and out of the squad. It is, it is almost smacks of them trying to force his hand and trying to get him out of the club to me. Because otherwise they'd protect their own player. They wouldn't name him and they wouldn't let him his his image be tarnished that way. Well, yeah, 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 true. Not aiming, uh, not naming, sorry, the other players, whoever that... I mean, I, Well, the only other name was Pele, who's out of the club anyway. Pele, yeah, and there was a story that the, the player who missed the bus entirely was Alex Milosevic. But again, I, I think, think that's, that's, that's conjecture. That's guesswork, yeah, given that people looking at, okay, who was dropped for yeah. however many games and then suddenly came back in. So, yeah, there's no um, no concrete evidence for any other players uh, behind what Danny Taylor has said. But, yeah, the Getty Aura one, I mean, if it's true that he has essentially ignored his manager's orders to call down because he's now on international duty, as it was put, then I'm sorry, that sort of behaviour is disgraceful because you're a paid professional and you've got to, you're paid to do your job and your manager is there and you listen to your manager. You might not always agree with him, but to, to completely ignore something as trivial as calling down after a, after a game of football, to me, it just smacks of... Well, I can totally understand why a player would say, when I haven't even got on the pitch, why well, should I have to join the cool-down? No, but they all do that. They, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, know, I, I, know, I, know, I know exactly what you're saying, and I know what the counter-arguments are, and I also totally agree that, as a player, you do what your manager tells you, 
the question being is, as a manager, how do you deal with it? Now, the thing that we do know, right, I'm, 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 I don't hold with all these dinosaur taunts or Rona O'Neill because I think tactically and in terms of his willingness to progress uh, with regards to the playing side of things, I think that's that was unfair and unfounded. What I do think is that discipline-wise, in terms of his man management, he's clearly cut from a cloth that doesn't isn't sustainable in in the modern game of that thing of like. I am the manager, you do what I say, and then if you don't do it, then you're out the club or I'm going to drop you or whatever. Um, and so it strikes me as though that's where the problem came from. It's not that he said, he sort of sat down with Adlan Gediora uh, and said, look, I'm going to find you two weeks wages. Um, you're going to be quietly dropped from the team for a little while. It's that it's it ended up being a big set two because it was probably one person shouting and another person shouting back. If you're O'Neill in that position, though, what do you do? Because you've got to stamp your authority on things. And I'm sure managers up and down the country will have these moments where they are challenged and their authority is challenged. So they've got to do something about it because if they seem to back down or seem to be too weak in the eyes of the players, then they're going but to let's, take advantage let's, of Let's that. use the example of Clough, one of the famous examples, which is that he was always always on Larry Lloyd's back. He, he always just kept him at arm's length very deliberately, but he always praised Kenny Burns within earshot of Larry Lloyd. Okay, So there's different tactics used for different players. Yeah, I think, I think you're, what you're saying is, is correct in the sense that it's not the footballing side that's let Martin down here. I, I, and Baz mentioned aiming for 25% possession. I, I don't believe for one second that O'Neill used to say to them, go out there, squander possession, don't, <laughs> don't, str don't string more than three passes together. When you've got a player in a red shirt 10 yards away from you, just pass it straight out of the pitch and just hoof it long, uh, aimlessly up the field without hitting a, uh, one of your own players. I, d I don't believe that for one second. I think where he ha has... Uh, failed is in the sense that culturally he's from a different time. His, 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 he has tr trouble relating to the younger generation of players and they have trouble relating to him. It's just, it's not just in football, it's in life in general. That, that generation of 20-somethings now, teenagers, are very, very different from 20-somethings uh, 20, 20 years ago. They are a lot more sensitive. You can't shout at them. This is not just in football, it's in any work environment. You can't, they, they won't do stuff that the, would have been sort of standard practice in many work environments. Um, the social media things have a big impact. They talk to each other. They don't, they don't, not as gregarious as people used to be, maybe. They don't go out as much as people used to be. It's just a whole cultural shift. And I just think Martin, as a 67-year-old man, has struggled to understand how a 21-year-old man now now thinks and believes. I, I look at my own dad's, He's the same age as Martin O'Neill, and he would struggle exactly the same way. He doesn't understand people who are of that generation. He just he just doesn't understand why they wouldn't want to work hard and and do the certain things that people of his generation would want to do. I think that's where he's maybe failed. He's just he's pre and it's almost a self fulfilling prophecy because the people who sort of rant against O'Neill are on Twitter and on social media, and the players are of that generation, so they see that and they in their own minds, it's eventually come to fruition where they think, yeah, this is a, he's out of touch, he's out of touch, and we, they're, they're following that for social media and, and becoming sort of less enamoured with Martin as time's gone on. And it's just it's a cyclical effect where it's just got worse and worse. I just... So if, if we look at the examples of... Um, so, the, say, the last three managers to have, uh, to have gained... to have won the championship, we've got Benitez... Uh, Nuno Spurs, Santo and Daniel Farca. Now, Nuno and Farca are very much of a different generation. Yeah, they're, I mean, that's, they're a very sort of huggy sort of cultural sort of... Yeah. Uh, from, it's the same with Klopp, it's the same with Brendan Rodgers. You saw it at Leicester, Claude Puel, very standoffish, very pro prim and proper, um, didn't say too much, wasn't wasn't seen as being too close to the players. Brendan Rodgers comes in, Rogers comes in and say, Jamie Vardy's the best striker in the country, Madison's the best young player in England, sort of going publicly going out onto the pitch, hugging them, and he's got the say he's got that that same day glow bright smile as the players. He uses the tanning bed same as the players who he's culturally much closely 
more aligned to them than Claude Puel ever was. And so all of a sudden they start playing well again. It's Klopp, he never comes out and criticizes. He's just out there hugging them, kissing them. And it's just, it's just not part of Martin O'Neill's makeup to do that. He's from a culturally a very different time. And, and that's what players seem to respond to. You can't criticize people now. You can only praise them. That's that's the problem. If you criticise them, you're like public enemy number one. That's okay. I wonder how Neil Warnock gets on though. Interesting. You, we've seen. But Neil, Neil Warnock, Warnock in public never, never calls out his players in public. But and he and was, even Alex Ferguson, he'd always that he took so much flack, but always, always defending the indefensible. But you know that in the dressing room, he'd have the, the famous hairdryer, and I suspect that Warnock's the same. I mean, he also still does tend to get the similar sort of players that he had maybe 20. He finds players to fit his style. He finds Pattersons and people like that, big tough players, Sambas, who are still tough guys and maybe cut from a different cloth from the rest of the generation. So he he's given time to sort of bring in players that will fit into his, his mould. Which is maybe what I was thinking. We'd do this this summer, we'd buy more players more suited to Martin O'Neill's style. <laughs> Let's move on to Sabri Lamushi, who is of a different generation. He is somebody who has um, played football, only recently got into management. Um, Stephen, who is Sabri Lamushi? Well, at the age of 47, he's 20 years younger than O'Neill and much younger and much of that generation that probably does relate to your modern footballer that, that a little bit better. Uh, decorated playing career, played for Auxerre, Monaco, Parma, Inter and Marseille and won 12 caps for France in his time. So and as a little a real footnote good there, uh, we discovered recently, didn't we, that he actually played for Auxerre at the city ground against Forest in the Europa Cup run of 95. Yeah, I was there, but I, I have no memory of him. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I just remember we couldn't get the ball off Auxerre. Yeah, that. yeah. And yeah, yeah. there two legs, that was a work. Corentin Martins and, um, oh, who was the player who ended up crying? Was it was it Basil Bolly? It might have been Basil Bolly. Uh, yeah, mate. Yeah, Basil Bolly was on the pitch, crying, banging the floor at at one stage. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so we have no recollection of Labushi <laughs> playing, but he the evidence is there. <laughs> There's a picture of him getting decked by Jason Lee as well, which is worth looking up. Um, <laughs> you haven't a, lived until you've been decked by Jason Lee. <laughs> as a manager, he's managed the Ivory Coast. That was his first job. Took them to the 2014 World Cup. So he worked alongside people like Yaya Toure, Didier Drogba, mm -hmm. and then went to El Jaish in Qatar. Mm -hmm. And then most recently was manager of Rennes mm -hmm. in France. And if I remember rightly, wasn't Philippe Montagnier man manager of Rennes at one point? So, clearly, so. Is, there a, is there a feeder system we're going on? <laughs> Maybe, yeah. I, th I think he was, yeah. Okay. So, um, and... So he's got a reasonable managerial record. Obviously, yeah. with Cote d'Ivoire, there is the argument that they could have done better as that was the most talented squad probably in their history. But, you know, equally, there's something isn't there about having the know-how at that level. So um, maybe as, as Lamushi was a relatively inexperienced manager. No, no. But the most, uh, or the most notable thing that he's achieved in management is taking Ren away from the relegation zone in League 1 before finishing fifth and taking them into to the Europa League. And that was last season. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the season before last. And then he left in December after a poor run of results. So it's been a, it's been a mixed bag. But certainly you look at what he did at Ren and that makes you think, well, maybe he's got something, something there about him. A bit like... Montagnier, where he took Raul Sociedad into the Champions League. He's had those moments in his career where you think, okay, that's okay. Decent so, achievement. what do we expect from playing style? Uh, well, I've been trying to do a bit of research into this. Um, some of the French football journalists have spoken about Lemouchi, they've been asked about him, and uh, they say that he's a hard working manager and he expects that from his players as well. Uh, that his teams play attractive football, but they can help also have a slightly more pragmatic approach. Isn't that what we basically heard about O'Neill? And and if we want to really press the nuclear button, Gary Megson. <laughs> well, yes, there is that uh, that side to it, isn't there? But yeah, define pragmatic and how far does pragmatic go? Mm -hmm. um, you could say Karanka was pragmatic, but he had a bit. Of, there was some 
decent attacking football in there as well. Well, Billy Davis. You know, Billy Davis is the most successful Forest manager of recent times in terms of results and in terms of getting Forest on the cusp of, of, of promotion. And it was all built upon, let's have that gritty under, underbelly and then allow the, 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 the talented players, Ian McGugans and so on, uh, to, to be able to express themselves. Yeah, so so looking at it from what, what we've seen so far of, of his time at Wren, um, he likes a 4-3-3, but he also likes a 4-2-3-1 formation, which would suit the players that we've got now. Um, particularly if you look, you could play Carvalho as a number 10 in that. You've got Graben as your, your lone striker, Lolly, and maybe Amiobi as, as the wingers, just as we are until we've, until we've made some more signings. So you can see where the players fit in. He also likes a 4-4-2 and going to that occasionally. So that might be the pragmatic side of him coming out. And it, it's, I mean, he sounds, I don't want to be too down on O'Neill, but perhaps sounds like a little bit more progressive. He might be a bit more trusting of players like Carvalho and even Lolly to a degree. And he might be looking to ship out players of the ilk of Watson, mm-hmm. you know, these, these slightly more grafting style of players. He, he might look to, to bring a bit more flair and a bit more technical ability into the team. OK. Um, so, uh, Married on the Midlands, in terms of players, OK, we've got a massive squad, haven't we? Yeah, and some of the problems O'Neill faced was a symptom of having such a massive squad and keeping that many that many players happy and is we've gone through that many times over the past couple of years. It's just that I, 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 there's no easy way around it now. We're just going to have to wait until some of the contracts run out and it's just going to cost the club money and you're going to have these players. And well, as, Having said that, you know, we've seen Velios leave and, and he was still under contract. So he's, he's, they obviously came to a deal with him. Yeah. We've seen Sudani go to Olympiox. I, I, I don't understand how that could have come about, <laughs> but, but making a profit on it as well. Um, yeah. For a player who played eight matches. Yeah, but we've still got a lot of players like Bridcut, Watson, Gudura. Um, there's a few players still in there. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, it's no easy way. Every, every club faces the same problem up and down the country. It's, it's very difficult to get rid of players once they're on a, on a hefty contract and nobody right. wants and, them. And so there's a couple of things. Um, Stephen, how long is Sabri Lamushi's contract as the head coach? Good question. <laughs> yeah, they've not mentioned it, have they? No. Nope. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because Martin O'Neill was on an 18-month contract. So they obviously said, we're not going to give him a big, long contract and, you know, offer him. Uh, Sammy Abiobi is, like, is, uh, again, as as so often, the reaction has been massively out of proportion. Um, but Sammy Abiobi is on a one-year contract on a free OK, so it is as low a risk a deal as you can do. And I'm wondering if this is going to be, again, a sign of the Maranakis regime in terms of they're only going to offer big contracts to players and coaches if they actually have real, real faith and confidence that that's going to pay off um, in a way that maybe wasn't wasn't the case previously. Um, maybe. I mean... You could say that giving O'Neill only that eighteen-month contract undermined him slightly. He didn't, it meant he didn't have the authority to to sort of boss the squad around as much as he maybe wanted, and the, and the players knew that. Um, I think the financial fair play aspect is going to come into it because we did spend big, and the wager bill has been so big. We, I think we're coming into a new three-year phase where they're going to re- uh, review our finances probably at the end of this season. So I think that's probably going to dictate it more than anything. And just the, the vast sums of money required. It's just that it, however rich you are as an individual, you just can't keep on ploughing in millions and millions and millions. We, I mean, we talk about a £5 million pound signing, a £7 million. Pound signing, but that's a huge amount of money yeah. in anybody's book. So it's just I think it's pragmatism going to come into it. There, there just isn't an endless pot of money just there to keep on buying player after player. And it's, it's well, just... and, and which was what was surprising about... So Karanka, obviously, um, he wanted to change the makeup in terms of playing ability, but also the mentality of the squad, which is probably one of the reasons why we saw such a huge player turnover. Um, now, the trouble is it means that we have got players who are on still under contract, 
um, who we may struggle to move on. Um, interestingly, though, uh, again, going back to the whole sort of behind the scenes stuff, it sounds as though the players who were brought in by Karanka ended up having issues with him. Um, so, so I wonder again if that adds the pragmatism of not giving players such long contracts, you know, trying to attract the players to the club in different ways rather than long contracts. I don't know if you've got any, any thoughts on that, Stephen. It's an approach that I can see, I can see the merits of it because you're not crippling the club financially. You're also giving the players a bit of a carrot in that they've got something to aim for, almost like a bonus in a way. If they want to have a two, three-year contract, they've got to earn it at Forest. And if that's an approach that we're going to take a bit more in the future, then I am all for it. The The downside to that might be that players, managers become even more disposable because we've only got them for a year. And the worry is that you're going to have such a high turnover of players and managers if if players don't work out or managers don't work out and you've got, you know, and you might get five, six, seven, eight, players moving on every summer if their one-year deals expire and then you've got a new raft of players coming in, could that cause more harm than good because there's just no continuity? But on the other hand, at the moment, we've got a squad of over 30 senior professionals and that's too many. Um, And it's costing the club a lot of money that way as well. Um, So I guess this is the reason why we're sitting here talking about it and not the ones making the decisions. Um, OK, a um, couple of other things uh, while we're at it. In terms of um, players and in terms of stuff at the club, um, Stephen, you'd attended the uh, the 40th anniversary celebrations um, and uh, you'd picked up one of the commemorative kits and it looked to me as though they were wearing the commemorative kit yesterday <laughs> in their friendly Alfreton. Um, but there's also a new kit that's been kind of a new home kit that's been launched. Um what do we think about the fact that, you know, things like the kit deal and the new um, shirt sponsor, um, again, are those signs of the fact that the club has progressed in terms of the off-the-field stuff? Yeah, commercially, you can see that uh, progress has been made. For example, Macron have offered Forrest the biggest kit deal in their history to be the kit supplier. Um, we had the, the financial issues with Betbright last season in the as a company did we folded. bankrupt Betbright? Because wasn't that the biggest shirt sponsorship deal we'd had as well? And then <laughs> and then they fell apart. <laughs> so we've we've acted quickly to get um, Football Index in as the new sponsor. So from a commercial side, it does seem like we're more switched on. Mm-hmm. And then you look at the stadium redevelopment as well. Yep. We're going to have all those corporate facilities now that the likes of Leicester and Derby have had locally for a few years, and they've had um, a head start on us in terms of bringing non-match day revenue into the club. And hopefully now, once this redevelopment is completed, we're going to see that revenue as well generated at Forest. And it's just another way to strengthen your financial resources. Okay, and is this going to be the um, issue that will hopefully get Forest over the line on the pitch in terms of strengthening their financial hand, in terms of the contracts and the players, the contracts they can offer and the players they can sign? I think it is. I think it's just uh, something you've got to do as a modern football club. You've got to, you've got to maximise your revenue wherever you can. And yes, I know money talks, and there's elements of that which uh, which aren't great at times. But it's it's just one of the the uh, the main issues, if you like, or one of the main elements of the modern game. And all the other clubs around you are going to be maximising. The, the revenue and the money that they can bring in, Derby, Leicester, as I've already mentioned. So from a Forest perspective, when we've had issues in the past with financial fair play, we've had transfer embargoes, we've had owners selling players out of nowhere because suddenly we need five, six, seven million pounds from from somewhere. Wherever we can we can generate revenue that's not on a match day, I, I think it's it's important to the club being more successful and uh, and run in a much better and more professional way. Okay, so once again, we've talked about the fact that off the field, the, the Maranakis regime has developed the club massively. Um, on the field, Maradon in the Midlands, um, 
should we still expect the churn of managers and players as we have done? And is that a Maranakis thing or is that just a modern football thing? Um, I mean, I'd like to think that no, we'd, we'd settle down, we'd, we'd be successful this with this manager, and, and we'd get a, a squad together that would take us up, and we'd be we'd be successful. But I, the evidence of the last twenty years just suggests it's not going to happen. I, I can just sit as, see us sitting here in six months' time saying, Why, "Where has Lamushi gone wrong? Why has he been sacked?" Um, I, at this moment, I'm, I'm not feeling particularly confident about the season. Um, it might change with a few signings and things, but. Um, I just, I think, just the the events of this this last few days have, have pointed out serious issues within the squad. Um, are a, they serious issues within the squad, or are they serious issues within the modern game? Like you mentioned earlier, you know, there is an issue about the way that generationally things work out. There is an issue in the fact that modern players love to be loved. Yeah, I mean that that is true, but I just think that there's, there's an attitude problem maybe that's been exposed at Forest. Um, there's so many of our young players. I mean, just the, just the fact they've got the, the audacity to get out one of the club's legends, the, the man who was on, on stage at the uh, European Cup celebrations a few weeks ago and being held as one of our heroes. And the, the fact that we've treated somebody like that, um, it, it just doesn't... Nobody's, nobody's coming out of this looking good. The, well, the players haven't come out, come out of this looking good. The ownership haven't for sort of treating a legend like that. Martin O'Neill hasn't because his reputation's been trashed, really. Everybody, they, they, the club didn't have to let out this news that is because the players were turning against him and he was out of touch. It's Nobody's come out of this well. And, um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic at this stage. If it's true that, man, uh, that players have turned on managers, they've turned on O'Neill, they've fallen out with Karanka, what's to say that Sabri Lamushi might do something completely innocuous as part of his... M- managerial style if the players don't like it are they going to go crying to the top brass again and complaining about what's going on and falling out with another manager it just seems okay it's, it's, it might not be it might not happen, true, happen but, with Pierce yeah um it seems to happen with Warburton as well it's just it's just every manager it's the same thing you know what's going to happen they have a good start to the season it gets a little bit tricky around about autumn time and then suddenly the players down and tools as ever and this goes with many many kinds of work and many things in life. It's it's not how you it's not how um, things feel when they're going well. It's how people react when things go less well, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but would that be the same? Is that a problem with players at Forest, or is that just a problem with football players? I say we've seen it happen at many yeah, I mean, other clubs. It, it might happen at eighty percent of clubs, but it's, it's the, that twenty percent or ten percent that that don't have that, and they're the ones that are successful, I guess. They're the ones who managed to have a good attitude and okay so on that bombshell that we need to aspire to be cardiff city (laughs) we're going to call it a day um we have recorded a special podcast about what makes a manager we recorded it before we lost martin but uh but uh it'll still be a good listen so we'll have that with you very very soon and we will be back once the season starts and hopefully there's not going to be any big shocks in the meantime uh thanks for joining us